family values between neoliberalism and the new social conservatism by Melinda Cooper. This is chapter three, um, part one. So the ethic of family responsibility, reinventing the poor laws. If we are right that the tide is turning, that public opinion is shifting away from a belief in big government and away from the doctrine of social responsibility, then that change will tend to restore a belief in individual responsibility by strengthening the family and reestablishing its traditional role. That is a quote from Rose and Milton Friedemann um, from Tyranny of the Status Quo. In 1996, President Bill Clinton enacted the single most dramatic overhaul of the federal welfare system since the New Deal. The Welfare Reform Act, otherwise known as PRWORA, the Personal Responsibility and Work Opportunity Reconciliation Act, abolished the Aid to Families with Dependent Children, AFDC, program, originally created as part of the 1935 Social Security Act, and replaced it with a time-limited program known as Temporary Assistance for Needy Families, TANF. Making good on his promise to end welfare as we know it, Clinton's landmark legislation sought as far as possible to replace public responsibility for the welfare of poor women with a state-enforced system of private family responsibility, that actively revived and sometimes created kinship relations ex nihilo. States were now required to increase their efforts to police, track down, and enforce paternity obligations on the presumption that the biological father of a child on welfare should be forced to pay child support to be deducted from state welfare payments, whether or not the mother wished to maintain a relationship with him. And in what must be understood as a blurring of the boundaries between the free and unfree sexual contract, sanctions were to be imposed on mothers who did not sufficiently cooperate in helping welfare agencies to locate the biological father of their children. By diverting a substantial portion of the federal welfare budget to the task of extracting child support from fathers, welfare reforms served to remind women that an individual man, not the state, was ultimately responsible for their economic security. Unless a woman could assume personal responsibility for her economic fate, she would have to accept her condition of economic dependence on an absent father or substitute husband. Reflecting a new bipartisan consensus on the social value of monogamous, legally validated relationships, Clinton's welfare reform also created a series of initiatives to promote the moral obligations of family including a special budget allocation to finance marriage promotion programs and millions of dollars in bonus funds for states that could demonstrate they had successfully reduced illegitimate births without increasing the abortion rate. These initiatives would be greatly expanded under the Bush and Obama administrations, where they flowered into elaborate healthy marriage and responsible fatherhood initiatives implicating multiple federal departments and consuming a growing portion of the federal welfare budget. The notion that private family obligations should ultimately take the place of welfare transfers was here supplemented by the idea that the state should take an active pedagogical role in cultivating proper family values among the welfare and non-welfare population alike. Under the sign of family responsibility, Clinton's welfare reform sealed an effective institutional alliance between neoliberal and new social conservative perspectives on the family. Their preoccupations were distinct. If neoliberals were adamant that the economic obligations of family should be enforced even when the legal and effective bonds of kinship had broken down, social conservatives were intent on actively rekindling the family as a moral institution based on the unpaid labor of love. Both agreed, however, that the private family, rather than the state, should serve as the primary source of economic security. By making family responsibility the guiding principle of federal welfare law, Clinton brought to fruition a social reform agenda 
initiated by Ronald Reagan as far back as the 1970s. As governor of, Ga- of California, Reagan had vowed to strengthen family responsibility by transferring the legal burdens of public assistance onto parents, adult children, and relatives. As president, he proclaimed that intact, self-reliant families are the best anti-poverty insurance ever devised, and tried with only partial success to translate this insight into federal welfare law. In the early 1970s, however, Governor Regan stood well to the right of the political mainstream, proving too extreme for many of his more moderate Republican colleagues. At a time when Nixon was hoping to extend New Deal social protections to include black men within the ambit of the Fordist family wage, Regan was busy reviving, or rather reinventing, a much older tradition of relief based on private family responsibility. This tradition last flourished in the late 19th century during the so-called Gilded Age of American capitalism, where both classical liberals and moral conservatives embraced it as the most appropriate way of managing the poor. Its origins can be traced back much further to the British and American poor law tradition, whose provisions made no distinction between the emotional and financial bonds of kinship, and virtually equated the moral and the economic functions of the family. In the 1970s, Ronald Reagan was nearly alone among Republicans in seeking to revive the discredited poor law tradition of family responsibility as an alternative to the New Deal welfare state. By the 1980s, such ideas had entered the mainstream of social policy debate and were openly championed by right-wing think tanks, such as the Heritage Foundation. Ultimately, however, it fell to the new Democrat, President Clinton, to realize the reactionary pipe dreams that had once been shunned by more moderate Republicans. The family responsibility tradition in American welfare originated in the Elizabethan and early colonial poor laws and was reinvented in post-Civil War America, where it flourished as an elaborate and invasive methodology for policing the lives of the poor. When New Deal social reformers sought to import the principles of European social insurance to America in the mid-20th century, it was this tradition that they needed to overcome in order to impose their own vision of redistributive, yet nevertheless family-centered welfare. Today, both neoliberals and new social conservatives see themselves as reversing this historical trajectory in order to recuperate a lost tradition of private family responsibility for the care of dependents. It is no coincidence that contemporary scholars ranging from the Christian libertarian Marvin Olosky to the thoroughly neoconservative Gertrude Himmelferb identify late 19th century America as a misrecognized golden age of natural charity in which free market capitalism happily coexisted with the most austere forms of moral conservatism. The peculiar alliance of economic liberalism and moral conservatism that triumphed in the Gilded Age is one that they would like to revive today, while recognizing in their more lucid moments that history reinvents rather than repeats itself. In practice, late 20th century welfare reformers could not simply revive the Gilded Age system of private, charity-based family responsibility. Rather, they sought to absorb its imperatives into the existing institutional structures of the welfare state. Thus, the effect of Clinton's welfare reform of 1996 was to requisition a once redistributive welfare program and repurpose it as an immense federal apparatus for enforcing the private responsibilities of family and work. What we are witnessing here is not the outright dismantling of the welfare state envisaged by libertarian conservatives such as Charles Murray or Marvin Olosky, but rather its reinvigoration as an instrument for imposing work and family obligations on the welfare poor. The family responsibility provisions that were once policed by charity workers in the courts are now incorporated incorporated into federal welfare law and imbued with all the institutional force of an elaborate national welfare infrastructure. The role of the poor law tradition in shaping recent welfare reform highlights 
or highlights some of the interpretive failures of popular accounts of neoliberalism. Most of these accounts focus on neoliberalism's overriding investment in the notion of personal responsibility. Jacob Hacker, for instance, denounces the neoliberal assault on social risk protections as a personal responsibility crusade and laments its destructive effects on public investment, job security, and the family. But an exclusive focus on free market individualism obscures the recurrent elision between the personal and the familial in neoliberal discourse, and thereby renders unintelligible its historical compatibility with various complexions of moral conservatism. Yes, neoliberals persistently exhort individuals to take responsibility for their own fate, and yet the imperative of personal responsibility slides ineluctably into that of family responsibility when it comes to managing the inevitable problems of economic, dependent, economic dependence. The care of children, the disabled, the elderly, or the unwaged. Wendy Brown speaks in this regard of a persistent legal and political tension between the individual and the family in liberalism, a tension which is clearly to be found in the poor law tradition, where the individual responsibility of sustaining oneself through waged work has always implied a wider responsibility toward unwaged dependence within the family. In the work of Milton and Rose Friedemann, the slippage is presented as so self-evident it requires no further elucidation. If we are right that the tide is turning, that public opinion is shifting away from a belief in big government and away from the doctrine of social responsibility, they write, then that change will tend to restore a belief in individual responsibility by strengthening the family and reestablishing its traditional role. The restoration of family responsibility is here presented as the natural consequence of the state's marginalization from the role of social welfare, as spontaneous and inexplicable as the freedom of the individual in a competitive market environment. Social conservatives are typically much more conscious of the conceptual paradox at work here and much more mindful of the coercive, nature, uh, the coercive force that must be harnessed to subordinate the free individual to the obligations of family. It may appear a paradox, notes Gary Bauer, President Regan's advisor on the family, that American society, with its emphasis on rights of the individual, has placed great value on a strong family structure. To some, after all, the nature of the family may seem opposed to freedom, a limitation on spouses bound by commitments to each other, a burden on parents obligated to care for children, and a restriction on children who live under parental authority. But Bauer, more than Milton and Rose Friedemann, understands that it is precisely such family obligations that sustain the otherwise inexplicable freedom of the liberal individual. The experience of history shows family and liberty to be natural companions, not enemies. The framers of our Constitution saw clearly that only those societies strong in certain civic virtues could sustain an experiment in representative democracy. The family is the primary training ground for individual responsibility, for self-sacrifice, for seeking a common goal rather than self-interest. Conversely, only in a society that allows individual freedom can family members exercise the initiative and responsibility that makes for strong family life. Here we can see how neoliberalism and neoconservatism are ultimately able to reconcile their differences. Neoliberals, such as Friedemann, begin with the self-evidence of individual responsibility, but end up affirming the necessity of familial obligations when confronted with the social costs of unwaged dependence. Social conservatives begin with the foundational importance of the family and derive the liberty of the individual from here. Both, however, seize upon the necessity of family responsibility as the ideal source of economic security and an effective counterforce to the demoralizing powers of the welfare state. Family Responsibility and the Elizabethan Poor Law Dating from 1601, the Elizabethan Act for the Relief of the Poor, otherwise known as the Elizabethan Poor Law, or the Old Poor Law, brought into being the first national system for the relief of pauper paupers in England and Wales. Comprising a multitude of new and old statutes, 
the act was designed to replace earlier forms of church-based charity with a new, more comprehensive system of parish-administered relief to be funded by compulsory land taxes. The poor law is just is justly recognized as the first serious attempt to organize public relief on a national scale. It unambiguously acknowledged the vicissitudes of the labor market and the consequent need for some kind of permanent support structure, but it also placed strict conditions on the distribution of relief. Among these, the first to be enforced was that of family responsibility, the idea that relatives within certain degrees of kinship should be compelled to provide as much support as possible before the parish dispersed any funds. Thus, the text of the original 1601 Act stipulated that the father and the grandfather and the mother and the grandmother and the children of every poor, old, blind, lame, and impotent person or other poor person not able to work, being of a sufficient ability, shall at their own charges relieve and maintain every such poor person. The Elizabethan Poor Law thus introduced new filial obligation rules, obliging adult children to care for their aging and impoverished parents, while also subsuming an earlier bastardy statute enacted in 1576, making both parents liable for the support of illegitimate children and outlining criminal charges for illicit sex act. Sex acts, plural. These statutory provisions supplemented the old common law duty obliging a husband to support his wife and were most commonly invoked in cases involving the poorest members of the parish. In each instance, the stated purpose of these rules was to relieve the local parish of the burden of public support by delegating primary resp responsibility to the family. Under certain circumstances, moreover, family obligations could be exchanged for work obligations which were also provided for under the Elizabethan Poor Law. If a local parishioner failed to provide due support for an indigent, in, indigent family member, he or she could be forced to work for free to reimburse the local authorities for the costs of relief. From the very beginning, the poor law enforcement of labor and family obligations worked hand in hand. When it came to adapting the laws and statutes of the old world to the new American colonies, each of the 13 states ended up replicating the Elizabethan poor law almost in toto, retaining many of the family responsibility provisions written into the original act. Every one of the colonies enacted criminal penalties against unmarried sex and civil laws requiring putative fathers to support illegitimate, illegitimate children. These laws seem to have applied most rigorously to indentured ser servants, again with the express aim of relieving local authorities of the burden of support. Historian Marianne Mason notes that the colonial poor laws were not simply prescriptive. Such laws were widely enforced with courts frequently ordering fathers to post bonds with the local authorities and senten sentencing unmarried mothers to physical penalties such as whippings. As in England, familial debts were readily monetized and transformed into work obligations. A female bonded servant who had conceived a child outside of wedlock might be required to extend her period of indenture to compensate for the costs of support, while a putative father could transmute criminal sanctions into a period of enforced work. These laws survived the end of the colonial period and served as a regulatory backdrop to the lives of the poor into the Republican era and beyond. At various historical junctures, the poor law's family responsibility provisions were revised or enlarged to respond to the changing boundaries between work and household. As the private family unit separated off from the productive household in the course of the 19th century, and as the family became smaller, the network of kin included under family responsibility rules grew correspondingly larger to include sisters and brothers, and grandchildren as well as grandparents. Likewise, as divorce became more common in the 19th century, new child support laws enforcing the responsibilities of estranged fathers were introduced both at common law and under new statutory provisions modeled on the original poor law. When the Civil War ended and former slaves were declared free laborers, 
they too came under the purview of newly invented family responsibility laws. As this history demonstrates, the poor laws were not only imported intact from England, but were subsequently reinvented many times over as a means of disciplining new kinds of sexual and economic freedom. As such, they have served to demarcate and police the outer bounds of the free labor market and consensual intimacy, enforcing the bonds of family and work as inescapable duties when the poor have failed to fulfill them of their own accord. The reinvention of the poor laws played a particularly significant role in the shaping of modern industrial capitalism and its signature political philosophies, first in England in the 1830s and subsequently in post-Civil War America. When the Royal Commission into the operation of the Poor Laws of 1832 investigated the state of pauper relief in industrial England, it found that the force of the original Poor Law had been hopelessly diluted by successive concessions on the part of local authorities. The Poor Law Commissioners were particularly alarmed by the fact that the generosity of relief measures appeared to be undermining not only the work ethic, but also the traditional bonds of family dependency. The worst results are still to be mentioned. In all ranks of society, the great sources of happiness and virtue are the domestic affections, affections, and this is particularly the case among those who have so few resources as the, as the laboring classes. Now, pauperism seems to be an engine for the purpose of disconnecting each member of a family from all the others, of reducing all to the state of domesticated animals, fed, lodged, and provided for by the parish, without mutual dependence or mutual interest. Work and family obligations, it concluded, should be reintroduced in the strictest of forms. Within the classical liberal tradition, personal responsibility and family responsibility were held together in a meta metonymic, metonymic relationship of mutual inclusion. When interpolated as an independent free worker, the liberal subject was required to assume personal responsibility for his fate, failing which he would be subject to the workhouse or some other regime of unfree labor. When the care of non-working dependents was at stake, however, personal responsibility was subsumed within the larger category of family responsibility, and the ideal of the independent individual incorporated within the wider notion of the self-sufficient family. Family support duties could then be imposed with much the same rigor as unfree labor. Both were understood as non-contractual obligations that the state had every right to enforce in the service of the free market contractual order. The new poor law was closely informed by the thinking of Thomas Robert Malthus, whose Christian political economy reflected a peculiar combination of classical liberal and moral conservative concerns. As the century progressed and the new poor law took shape as a comprehensive philosophy of charitable social reform, the ethic of family responsibility came to clearly reflect this double provenance in classical liberal and conservative philosophies of the social. The new scientific charity reformers, the new scientific charity reformers of late 19th century Britain and America saw themselves as the inheritors of the new poor law and sought to transform its sparse legislative dictums into an all-pervasive form of social regulation. These reformers understood the economic and moral obligations of family to be inseparable components of the law. It was not enough to protect public coffers by enforcing the economic duty of family support. One should also seek to rehabilitate the family itself in a form imagined to be traditional. As the point of articulation between the economic and moral obligations of kinship, family responsibility served as a rallying cry for classical liberals and moral conservatives alike. While free market liberals were concerned with enforcing the economic obligations of family, even when the moral and social bonds of kinship had broken down, conservatives were convinced that moral and legal foundations of the family needed to be shored up before the economic costs of marital breakdown could be properly attended to. In many cases, however, both philosophies were shared in some combination by one and the same person.
two key moments in the history of the poor laws, family responsibility provisions can be identified. First, family responsibility laws were extended to include newly enfranchised African Americans in the post-Civil War period. Subsequently, such laws were revised and intensified in Gilded Age America, where they served to regulate the lives of the white American and migrant working class. In both instances, the ethic of family responsibility brought together classical, liberal, and moral conservative perspectives on the obligations of family, and thus actively enabled the peculiar alliance between radical free market economics and moral traditionalism that flourished in late 19th century America. In the aftermath of the Civil War, family responsibility laws served to introduce former slaves into the rigors of the free labor market, while also authorizing a new social conservative ethos of domestic life among African Americans themselves. And in Gilded Age America, such laws helped to reduce public welfare spending to a, minim to a minimum, but were also supplemented by a more ambitious campaign to rehabilitate the traditional family among the general population. It was this classical liberal conservative ethic of family responsibility that needed to be defeated before the New Deal welfare state could come into being in the early 20th century. Promoting the African American family, reinventing the poor law after emancipation. The creation of the Freedmen's Bureau in 1865, an institution designed to oversee the transition of former slaves from a state of bondage to freedom is recognized as the first experiment in federal relief ever implemented by Congress. The welfare historian Walter Tratner goes so far as to characterize the Bureau as the nation's first federal welfare agency. Its establishment represented an unprecedented federal effort as the government took responsibility for the relief and sustenance of the emancipated slaves. Despite its scale, however, the Bureau's experiment in federal relief was never imagined as anything more than a transitional project and was designed to be phased out within a few years. Even as the Bureau offered temporary relief then, helping former slaves to settle and find work, it also sought to transform African Americans into independent citizens and free laborers, appropriately, appropriately schooled in the arts of contractual freedom and marital obligation. As Amy Drew Stanley has argued, classical liberalism posited a reciprocal relationship between the freedom of contractual labor and the non-contractual non obligations of marriage. Abolitionists had denounced slavery for stripping the black man of both his freedom to sell his own labor and his legal rights over the labor of wife and children. They therefore imagined full emancipation as the moment in which black men would simultaneously be granted contractual freedom in the labor market and contractual rights vis-a-vis -vis their dependents. True emancipation would not be secured until former slaves and incipient, incipient free laborers had been granted the same rights to marriage and paternity as white men. Before the Emancipation Proclamation of 1863, slaves had no legal right to enter into commercial labor contracts and were precluded from the civil contract of marriage. Allowing legal marriage among slaves would have granted the male slave property rights and the labor of his wife and children and would therefore have threatened the absolute rights of the white slave master who was considered the head of household and master of all his dependents. Men, women, and children alike, free and unfree, the effect of emancipation was to restrict the absolute power of the white head, the white head of household, by limiting his property rights to his immediate wife and children. But in the process, it also created a new gendered power relation between former slaves, elevating freed black men over women by endowing them, like white men, with rights and responsibilities toward their legal wives. At the same time as the Freedmen's Bureau attempted to transform former male slaves into free wage laborers, then it also taught them that freedom in the labor market came with the right to marry and the responsibility to support a wife and children. To drive home this lesson, Bureau agents set about overseeing wage contracts 
and formal marriages among emancipated slaves in the very first years of Reconstruction, ensuring that both were enforceable by law. In many cases, in fact, the civil marriage and labor contract were conjoined, since women were not considered to be free laborers on par with men. Bureau agents routinely allowed men to contract for the labor of their wife and children as a means of sustaining a family wage. Throughout the South, Freedmen's Bureau agents pursued a vigorous campaign to promote marriage among slaves, many of whom had previously been united in form in informal unions, had cohabitated, or were involved in multiple relationships. Bureau agents were authorized to perform wedding ceremonies, to certify or dissolve informal unions that had begun before emancipation, and to track down spouses who had been forcibly separated by slave masters. In all instances, they sought to regularize or dissolve what they perceived to be the illegitimate immoral and informal unions that had existed under slavery. Beyond these efforts at legal formalization, however, the Bureau also offered a sustained pedagogy of domestic life, schooling men in the notion that they were to become the breadwinners of the family and women in a new kind of economic dependence vis-a-vis free men. The marriage promotion efforts of the Freedmen's Bureau were soon taken up and expanded by state legislatures. Almost immediately after emancipation, states across the South enacted legal reforms to transform the informal marriages initiated under slavery into properly formal unions. Several methods were used. Some states simply conjured up legal marriages ex nihilo, declaring that cohabitating couples were henceforth to be considered husband and wife, whether or not they wished to be married. Others established a time limit of nine months within which former slaves were required to legitimize their informal unions or stop living together. As soon as they became applicable to African Americans, marriage laws were enforced ruthlessly. Former slaves who continued to cohabit without formalizing their unions or forcibly married slaves who moved on to a new partner without divorcing were subject to prosecution under adultery and fornication laws. Until the time of its dissolution in 1872, the Freedmen's Bureau continued to work closely with state legislatures or legislators to police these rules. The Bureau's interest in marriage promotion was motivated foremost by the fear that former slaves, particularly women and children, were likely to become a huge public burden if they were not to take if they were not taken care of within the context of the legal family unit. Here, what prevailed was a classical liberal concern with the social costs of dependency and a desire to transform these costs to the private sphere. The Freedmen's Bureau and Southern legislatures had good reason to fear that the many thousands of women without husbands and children, without legal fathers, that had been created by the act of slave emancipation would become dependent on public relief if they were not immediately reinserted within the legal structures of the family. By creating family obligations where none had been possible before, the Freedmen's Bureau and Southern legislatures hoped to relieve the state of any responsibility toward this newly liberated population of free laborers and potential dependents. As if to underscore the point that marriage was to serve as a substitute for public relief, many states passed new statutes extending spousal maintenance and child support laws to African American men during this period, effectively updating the poor law tradition of family responsibility to include former slaves. When men were unable or unwilling to fulfill these obligations, they and their children could be sentenced to to convict labor often on the estates where they had once been slaves, while women could be forced into either convict labor or domestic servitude. For most former slaves, then, the promise of free labor proved short-lived. The various black codes passed by Southern legislatures in the wake of Reconstruction comprised an elaborate array of criminal sanctions for everything from vagrancy to out-of-wedlock childbearing and failure to support one's children. Because it was nearly impossible for former slaves to attain self-sufficiency, self-sufficiency, most were very rapidly forced back into convict labor, debt peonage, or domestic servitude, 
in what marked as reinscription of the boundaries of unfree labor. In this way, African Americans were unceremoniously inducted into the poor law tradition of legally enforceable family responsibility at the very moment they were welcomed into the world of contractual freedom. Here, as in England, under the new poor law of 1834, the radical implementation of classical liberal principles of freedom went hand in hand with the brutal assertion of family and work obligations. At the same time, this punitive imposition of family obligations, most often directed at fathers and husbands, also served as the basis for new claims to patriarchal authority on the part of African American men and a new social conservative ethos of African American domesticity. By granting black men the right to sign contracts on behalf of wives and children, and assigning wage scales that penalized women, the Freedmen's Bureau not only made black men responsible for the support of their families, it also empowered them to assert their rights over women and children. The law of paternal responsibility could be enforced by criminal sanctions, but it could also be celebrated as a moral virtue and mandate for patriarchal authority within the household. This vision of virtuous family life would be fully embraced by African-American conservatives in the latter part of the 19th century, even as many of the other political victories of emancipation were reversed. The Gilded Age, Family Responsibility, and the Free Market In many respects, the Freedmen's Bureau represented a unique episode in the history of American public relief. Not only was it the first attempt by the federal government to organize a large-scale relief effort, but it was also particularly ruthless in its application of new family responsibility laws. The Freedmen's Bureau was a demonstration project in the fullest sense of the term. Its primary objective was to induct former slaves into the rigors of legal marriage and to warn them of the dire consequences that would, that would follow any attempt to elude the attendant responsibilities. Yet its lessons were also directed at the wider population. The Bureau's experiment in creating market and free labor thus anticipated in compressed form some of the austere economic and social reforms that would also be extended to white domestic and migrant workers throughout the last decades of the 19th century, the gilded age of American capitalism. The ethos of free labor emerged triumphant from the Civil War, seemingly vindicated by the defeat of America's old slave order. Inspired much more directly by the social Darwinism, Darwinism of William Graham Sumner and the American romantic tradition of Ralph Waldo Emerson than by professional political economists, the laissez-faire credo of classical liberalism attained a popular common-sense status in the United States that it always struggled to achieve in England. In the wake of the Civil War, American workers and employers alike vied to position themselves as champions of free labor, although by the end of the century, corporations had well and truly won the discursive war. During the Gilded Age, courts perfected what has come to be known as a jurisprudence of the free market. Interpreting the Declaration of Independence and 14th Amendment as defenses of corporate monopoly and insisting that bosses and employees should be free to negotiate the terms of employment at will, unfettered by legislative interference from the state. And while the courts were busy imposing contractual freedom in the workplace, state legislatures oversaw a corresponding expansion of poor law family obligations in the domestic sphere, with the ultimate aim of displacing the burden of relief from the public to the private realm. As the Reconstruction experiment in free labor had demonstrated, the contractual freedom promised by classical liberal economics or economics could not be implemented without without at the same time enforcing the private strictly contractual obligations of family. It is here, perhaps, that we can locate the historical and political origins of the slippage between individualism and family values um, that Wendy Brown identifies as intrinsic to classical liberalism. In the immediate post-Civil War years, however, the rigors of free market contractualism were yet to assert themselves in full. Faced with the multiple challenges of industrialization, the arrival of large numbers of economic migrants from Europe and a succession of economic downturns, many large cities actually expanded their public relief programs towards the end of the 1860s. Before long, this trend was met with the organized opposition of industrialists, 
and social reformers who feared that any distortion of the natural price of labor would deprive them of a docile workforce. Over the following years, their campaign was so successful that by the early 1890s, many cities had withdrawn completely from the provision of outdoor relief and had instead shifted the burden onto a panoply of private charitable agencies and religious organizations. Between 1874 and 1900, writes historian Stephen Pimper, one-fourth of the 50 largest American cities, and many smaller ones as well, abolished welfare. Outdoor relief, or out-relief, they called it. One-third reduced their roles and relief expenditures, and one-fifth offered only in-kind aid, like food or coal, but no more cash. Most imposed on a new work test as a condition for relief, which even to the most deserving was given sparingly, if at all. As the states withdrew from the provision of public relief, they redoubled their efforts to enforce family and work obligations. Despite its pretensions to laissez-faire spontaneity, economic liberalism has always relied in practice on the poor laws which have always relied on the police powers of the American states, to regulate everything from domestic relations to morality to vagrancy. The work of the legal historian William Novak serves to remind us that the so-called laissez-faire capitalism of the late 19th century was underwritten by extensive state police powers to regulate and punish the poor. Family responsibility laws that compelled unmarried fathers to support illegitimate children or adult children to pay for the care of indigent, indigent, indigent parents fought under the police powers of the American states, which could use everything from local relief authorities to courts and private charities to enforce these obligations. In the late 19th century, the reinvigoration of the poor laws was aided and abetted by a new and flourishing enterprise in private charity, which supplemented the punitive power of the state with an intimate form of regulatory control extending into the homes of the urban poor. Among the many private charities that sprang up during this period, the Charity Organization Societies, common, commonly referred to as the COS, were particularly influential in shaping common sense ideas about the proper relationship between contractual freedom and family obligation. Gilded Age charity reformers sought to persuade state governments and private charities that a truly competitive market in free labor could only be achieved if the distorting and demoralizing effects of indiscriminate relief were reduced to a minimum. The COS claimed to have perfected a method of scientific charity that could distinguish between the deserving and undeserving poor, and they preferred to err on the side of caution rather than corrupt the poor with undue benevolence. Public relief should only be dispensed as a last resort, after all, other avenues of charity, chief among them the natural charity of the family, had been exhausted. Like their British counterparts, American COS reformers understood themselves to be implementing the lessons of the new English Poor Law of 1834, which they saw in turn as a revival of the austere spirit of the original Elizabethan Poor Laws. The Royal Commission on the Poor Law of 1832 had condemned outdoor relief to the able-bodied poor as a violation of natural law that promoted improvident marriages and relieved the poor of their family responsibilities. The English and American charity organization societies reiterated this critique of public relief and argued that charity should seek above all to reinvigorate the natural support mechanisms of the family. In the words of the English COS reformer Charles Stuart Locke, social bonds must be maintained and utilized, family obligation, care for the aged, responsibility for the young, help in sickness or trouble must be borne to the extent of its capacity by the family. If the poor law tradition provided a legal framework within which to enforce the private obligations of family, one that was actively invoked by states when they deployed their extensive police powers over family life, the charity organization societies went further than this to construct an elaborate social methodol methodology for inciting and policing the ideal of family self-sufficiency. One of the chief innovations of late 19th century COS reformers was the friendly visitor, the usually female middle-class caseworker who was sent forth into the homes of the poor to educate them in the habits of appropriate uh, gender difference and family responsibility.
In a handbook written for other charity workers, the General Secretary of the Baltimore COS, Mary Richmond, instructed friendly visitors in the art of stimulating the charity of family members. Charity serves only to weaken natural ties, she warned, unless it is certain that relatives have done all they can, all that they can, or unless it has brought pressure to bear, at least to induce them to do their part. Friendly visitors were advised to pursue kin, friends, and neighbors as sources of support before soliciting help from the local church, private charity, or, as a last resort, public relief. The charity organization societies were particularly concerned with the problem of married vagabonds, men who had been legally married but had deserted or divorced their wives and no longer provided for their families. Rates of separation and divorce increased dramatically in the final decades of the 19th century, confronting charity workers with a growing population of women and children without adequate means of support. In response to this problem, COS workers made strenuous efforts to update and administer a series of new poor law provisions designed to enforce the responsibilities of absent fathers. In the early years of the 19th century, the American courts had invented a new common law duty of child support for parents who had separated or divorced, but no such duty existed in the poor law tradition, which had hitherto concerned itself with illegitimate children only. While the common law duty of child support su sufficed for middle-class parents who had the means to initiate private actions in the courts and were not likely to create a burden on public relief, charity workers now sought to create a comparable body of statutory law that would allow them to take routine administrative action um, against the working class men. Um... I lost my spot there. Having lobbied state legislatures throughout the 1870s, the COS reformers managed to convince a dozen states to pass new criminal statutes before the end of the century. Under the terms of these statutes, fathers could be imprisoned for failing to provide child support, child support. <clears throat> but prison sentences could also be transmuted into forced work. As in the original Elizabethan poor laws, the legal duty of family responsibility was understood to be monetizable in the form of labor. Familial debts could be paid off in the guise of indentured labor if a father could not make enough money to satisfy the courts. Family crisis in the Gilded Age. Although in the short term, the COS reformers wished to enforce the economic obligations of family as an alternative to public relief, they also nursed a more ambitious, long-term vision of social reform. In the wake of the Civil War, charity reformers joined a growing chorus of social commentators, from evangelical Protestants to labor radicals and social scientists, to denounce the laxity of marriage laws and their disintegrating effects on social order. These critics feared that the traditional moral fabric of American life was being destroyed by a perfect storm of malign influences, the dispersion of households as young people migrated en masse to the industrial heartlands, the anonymity of urban life, which enabled young people to socialize without the burden of parental surveillance, interracial mixing, and the rise of a feminist movement intent on questioning male authority in the household. Commenting on the profound demographic changes that took place in this era, the social historian David Wagner observes that the post-Civil War period through the end of the 1870s may have been a period analogous to others in American history, most famously the 1920s and 1960s to 70s, in which there was something of a sexual revolution. This revolution in sexual mores appears to have triggered a full-blown discourse of family crisis and a heightened concern with the inadequacy of existing domestic relations law. Such concerns had simmered throughout the antebellum period, but they emerged as a fully-fledged movement for legal and social reform only in the last decades of the 19th century. In 1841, the United States Supreme Court Justice Joseph Story challenged the then widely accepted practice of common law or contractual marriage by calling for a clear distinction between the civil contract of marriage and the commercial contract of exchange. Although marriage was a contract in the common sense definition of the word, it was also something more than a mere contract. 
it was rather to be deemed an institution of society founded upon the consent and contract of the parties, and in this view has some peculiarities of its nature, character, operation, and extent of obligation different from what belongs to ordinary contracts. Following the Civil War, the idea that the domestic sphere should be distinguished from and protected from the market became hegemonic. According to the modern will theory of contract, the commercial contract was by definition breachable by either party in exchange for compensation. Marriage, by contrast, came to be understood as a special kind of contract, one that could not be breached at will. Thus, even while coverture was being undermined in favor of a contractual understanding of marriage, the marital contract was defined in exceptional terms, subject to irrevocable consent, as in rape and marriage laws, default-based breach, as in divorce laws, and to the imperative of inalienable labor, which gave rise to the expectation that wives would perform household labor for free. Through the very exceptionalism of its terms, the sexual contract testified to what Durkham would later describe as the non-contractual foundations of the contractual, for everything in the contract is not contractual. In accordance with this view, the laws governing intimate relationships became considerably stricter in the last decades of the century. During this period, most states moved to restrict or outlaw common law marriages, raised the age of consent, reestablished waiting periods for marriage, banned interracial unions, and criminalized abortion and contraception. Thus, a, so a social conservative view of the family as the foundation of moral order and the bastion of traditional non-market values came into being alongside the laissez-faire individualism of the Gilded Age, not as its contradiction, but as its necessary counterpart. Working at the boundaries of the labor market and the domestic sphere, Gilded Age charity reformers neatly articulated the concerns of classic, classical laissez-faire liberalism with a moral conservatism focused on the private family. These reformers were convinced that the doctrine of family responsibility responded to the fiscal exigencies of the free market and the liberal state, but they also believed that the economic obligations of kin could not be properly enforced without a comprehensive effort to rebuild the family as the very foundation of social order. It was this classical liberal conservative regime of private family responsibility that needed to be challenged before the progressive New Deal order of public responsibility could come into being.